morning, church. How are you doing? Doing good? The worship was awesome, wasn't it? And, well, today we are continuing this campaign of Belong, these sermons. And today we are going to be talking about uh, worship. How uh, we belong to a community, uh, to a church that worships God. Uh, we're going to be talking about the power of corporate worship. Okay, the, ba the base um, verses for these sermons have, have, has been in Ephesians 2, 19 to 22, and it says, So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together we are his house. Can you say that with me? Together we are his house. And then it says, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And the cornerstone is, G is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of his dwelling where God lives by his spirit. Wow. You know, and there's so much truth in this. When we worship together as the body of Christ, God lives there. In Psalms 22, 3, it says, But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. He lives and he inhabits the worship and the praise of his people. It is of such importance for us as brothers and sisters in Christ to know that when we gather as a church, when we fellowship, God is in our midst. The importance of worship as a community is of such power beyond our reasoning, beyond what we can see. Spiritual things go on while we as a people worship. The blessing that comes from creating uh, God's habitation is the power that comes with his presence. That is why Hebrews says, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing. Seems like uh, Paul had the same uh, troubles that we have now, right? The people don't go to church. Ah, uh, we won't go this Sunday. You know, we got the game, and we got this, and we got the, oh, we'll go next Sunday. Next Sunday comes, and ah, uh, we'll go next Sunday. And we don't give church that priority where we say we need to join with our brothers and worship our God. It was Martin Luther who said, to gather with God's people in united adoration of the Father is as necessary to the Christian life as prayer. I'm going to say it one more time. To gather with God's people in united adoration of the Father is as necessary to the Christian life as prayer. It may be that you've never seen worship in this way. It may be that you never have taken worship seriously. I've heard dozens of things. Things such as, well, it doesn't matter if we get to, if we get to church late. We'll get there for the sermon. That's the important part of church. Uh, worship is just to make time for the people to get there. That's what worship is for. Wow. And these things that I've heard, not in this church. I've heard them in other churches. Not, I know you guys are cool with that. <laughs> when we have that attitude towards worship, we are actually saying, look, it's not that important. To acknowledge God for who he is and being grateful for what he's done. And we do this unaware of the importance God gives to worship. In his word, in the Bible, it, it underlines the importance of worship. Check this out. It underlines the importance of, of worship 8,629 times. 8,600 
29 times. It is mentioned more than prayer. It is mentioned more than salvation, more than mercy. It is mentioned more than power. God gives worship such importance. When, when he went to visit Mary and Martha and Lazarus at their home, Martha was so busy getting everything ready for Jesus, serving and everything. And she got mad at, Mar at Mary, seeing her at the feet of Jesus. And she started complaining, Jesus, can't you see what she's doing? She's doing nothing. And then Jesus says, uh, actually, <laughs> she's doing the most important thing right now. And you should learn from her. I'm not saying that being busy and doing things for the Lord is not important. It is important. And thank you, God, for all the servers. And thank you, God, for the people that, that are always active in, in, in the Lord. But the most important thing is to worship. To be at his feet. In John 4, 23, it says that if there is something that God is looking for, it is a worshipful heart. A, a heart that will worship him in spirit and in truth. That is what he is seeking. So today, we're going to be seeing some reasons why we should gather together with our congregation to worship our God. The benefits of worshiping together, yes, is that uh, we create God's dwelling. But God's dwelling produces incredible blessings for our lives. There is a power that is stirred up when we come together as a worshiping body of Christ. There is healing, freedom, deliverance, empowerment, restoration, renewal, salvation. And so much many things are waiting for you to tap into through worship. The first thing we're going to look at is that we obtain, what we obtain from worship in this environment, in community, is a very important thing. And that is the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And I wanted to talk about what this is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because some of us have this strange idea of what it is to be filled with his Holy Spirit. Some of us are scared of that. We're like, I don't want to be filled with the Holy Spirit if I'm going to be doing what that guy does. <laughs> but the, 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 the infilling of the Holy Spirit simply means that God lives within you expressed in power. Power to love power to witness, serve, give, forgive, and walk with God in holiness. Before Jesus ascended to heaven, after his resurrection, he asked his disciples to go, go, go and witness. Be a witness. But he told them this, don't do it without being filled with the Holy Spirit. Wait. Wait. Wait for the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon you. Why? Why did he say that? My brother, my sister, because you ain't getting nowhere without the Holy Spirit. It is of great importance as children of God to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Because he directs, he leads, he comforts, he empowers, he gives joy. He delivers, he restores, he convicts of sin, and loves. We can't do much without the Holy Spirit as a car cannot go anywhere without gasoline. I mean, that car can be washed up, shiny, new wheels, rims, the whole deal. But if it doesn't have gas, it doesn't work. It's not going to work. It's not going to take you anywhere. You can't move that car if it doesn't have gas. Well, actually, you can move it if you push it. Yeah. 
If you put all your strength, all your sweat into it, it'll probably advance little by little to where you want to be, to where you want to go. But you will end up burned out and exhausted, frustrated. And put plainly, it's just ridiculous that someone would go to work every morning like this. Wake up and say, honey, I'm taking the car to work, uh, but it doesn't have any gas. I don't care. I'm going to push it. <laughs> You're going to what? I'm going to push the car to work, but you haven't put gasoline in two months. doesn't matter. I'm going to push the car all the way to work. It's crazy, huh? Well, many Christians live their Christian life like this. They see the Holy Spirit as something they can live without. And there they are, trying to push their Christianity to where they think they should be, getting frustrated with the struggles they have, getting burnt out, struggling to live a holy life, struggling to forgive, struggling to love, struggling to serve. At best, they appear to be all right on the outside with a smile. And they shake your hand and God bless you, brother. Hallelujah. But the truth is, they will get burnt out. They will end up frustrated. Now, did you know that the infilling of the Holy Spirit is tied directly to worship? In community you see the Holy Spirit is God and the word says that where there is praise where there is worship God inhabits the worship of his people he's not up in his throne over there in heaven and just with his arms crossed sitting down and while we worship he's like oh, they're doing a good job Sounds cool. Joey and Misa, you know, they do a good job in leading the church. No. He loves, to heal, he, he loves to hear your worship. And he comes down and he dwells in this house of worship that you are creating for him. He comes down. And he fills each and every one of us that worship him with a sincere heart. Look what Ephesians says about this. Ephesians 5, 18 and 19 says, Be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts. Wow. The infilling of the Holy Spirit is directly tied to our collective worship as a church. The Bible says that as we sing and make music to God amongst ourselves, we are filled with His presence. We are filled with His Spirit. When we worship together, we have to realize this. We have to think about this when we come to the house of the Lord to worship. When we're getting ready at home, what are we getting ready for? Who are we getting ready for? At what time are we getting ready? Hallelujah. It went really quiet. <laughs> At what time are we getting ready? Do we wake up early? Do we, are we excited we're going to church and I'm going to worship God with all my heart? Are we, oh, okay, oh, it's the worship still on, so we, we got time. Amen. If you can't say any amen, say ouch. That's okay with me. Worship is so important. We are energized when we come here and we worship God. We are filled with his presence. We are filled with his spirit to be energized, to go forth in our Christian lives. 
Yes, we have issues. Yes, we have maybe hang-ups. Yes, we have things going all around us. But our perspective of those things change. They change when we have our God in the place where he should be. We are empowered to take on life's challenges. And best of all, we are empowered to be a witness of Jesus to others, of his love for others. When we are empowered by God, nothing can come against us. When we come to church and we worship and we are filled with his presence, we can go out to the world. Temptation can come. Those bills can come. Hallelujah. <laughs> but nothing can come against us when we are so just soaked in God's presence when we worship him we are released to do his will when we are empowered by God when we are filled with his Holy Spirit we are released to fulfill his purpose in our lives we get a better understanding of what he wants to do through us in us I preached about this the last time when we worship there is a freedom there is an understanding of the freedom he has given us when you belong to a community of worshipers power is released upon you and great things are only a step away if you only decide to worship to be part of this community of this fellowship that worships God. Another benefit of worshiping corporately is that our faith is built upon when we worship together. Our faith grows. Let me just talk about uh, faith a little bit before getting into how our faith is built through worship. There was nothing that excited or amazed Jesus more than a person with faith. It excited him. He was amazed at people that would come and ask things and, and that would believe him. He, was, he, he would get excited about it. You know, actually, he would get pretty ticked off when his disciples were lacking faith. He would. Ah, you men of little faith. Till when will I have to stand you? <laughs> he did say that. Till when will I have to be with you? In one time, one occasion, uh, Jesus had done so many miracles. I mean, great miracles. And um, he decided to, to take a, a rest and, and get on the sailboat and cross the sea. And when he got on that boat, man, he fell asleep. He was tired, and he fell asleep. In the middle of the sea, a storm broke out. And the Bible says that the waves were huge, and they would cover the boat. And the disciples, they were scared. They were afraid, and they started screaming. They were like, oh, my God, what do we do? So they go and wake up. Jesus, 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 and Jesus say, what? And the disciple go, we're gonna die! And Jesus gets up. I don't know about you, but if you wake me up in the middle of a nap, <laughs> you're gonna get some humanist attitude. So they go wake up Jesus, and Jesus wakes up with some Nazareth attitude. And he's like, are you serious, guys? You're waking me up because of this? Where's your faith? Where's your faith? And he goes out, and he does what they could have done. He stops the storm. 
Jesus wouldn't, wouldn't have got, gotten after them if he didn't know they, they could have done it. You know, he, he knew they could have done it. But no, there they go and wake them up. And Jesus gets mad and tells, where's your faith? Activate your faith. You could have stopped the storm and let me sleep. Jesus stopped the storm. A few verses before this, Jesus is amazed of a faith, of the faith of a Roman officer. In Matthew 8, starting in verse 5, let's read this. It says, When Jesus returned to Capernaum, a Roman officer came and pleaded with him. Lord, my young servant lies in bed, paralyzed and in terrible pain. Jesus said, I will come and heal him. Jesus was willing to go with him. But the officer said, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come into my my home. Just say the word from where you are and my servant will be healed. Verse 10. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed. Turning to those who were following him, he said, I tell you the truth. I haven't seen faith like this in all Israel. And I just imagine the disciples going, we've got faith. I mean, we're following him. But Jesus says, I haven't seen faith like this in all Israel. Israel. Then verse 13, then Jesus said to the Roman officer, go back home because you believed. Because you believed. Say it with me. Because you believed, it has happened. And the young servant was healed, healed that same hour. Believe. Believe. Faith is the key that activates God's power for us. If you believe, the Bible says, if you believe, everything is what? Possible. If you believe, everything is possible. Not certain things, no. Everything is possible. That which you are trying to have, that which you are struggling to to, uh, uh, forget, that which you are struggling to leave, to let go of, believe. And it will be possible. That cancer, that sickness, that illness, it will go if you believe. It's by faith that you are saved. How great is that? (laughs) It's by faith that you are saved. The greatest use of faith ever is salvation. Just because you believe your sins are totally erased, erased and forgiven. Just because you believe, you don't have to worry about those flames in hell. Just because you believe. But in our everyday lives, faith can do so much more for us and for God's kingdom. Faith activates the word of God. The Roman officer said, just say the word. Wow. Church, are you understanding this? He said, just say the word. When we believe what is in God's word, we activate it in our lives. We activate the word of God. All the promises that are in the word. All the purposes that are in the word of God for our lives, for your life. Is activated when you have faith. When you believe it. Now, how is our faith built through worship? That's sort of weird, Misael. What do you mean by that? I remember Joey sharing one Sunday morning that when we all get together and worship, we are literally reminding ourselves of who God is. You know, all the songs we sing here are Bible-based songs, scripture Based songs. 
songs that have to do with the word of God. And just even hearing and singing that builds your faith. Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's by hearing the word of God that you, that your faith is built. It could be from someone preaching it from the pulpit. It can be by you reading the word of God, or it can be by singing it, that your faith is built. How many of you have been in worship services or, or been in um, your own personal devotional and a song comes up and you, you leave that devotional thinking you can conquer the world on your own? That's faith building up inside of you. So when you come to church and sing out the praises of God, when you declare his word through song, you are building your faith, my brother, my sister. And when we do it in community, we see others. Maybe you're there and and you know that your sister in Christ is is going through a, a sickness or an illness. And you hear her cry out, you are my healer. What does that do to you? Like, wow, if she can believe it, I can believe it. Maybe you see your brother that's going through a, a financial drought, and he's crying out to God, you are my provider, Jesus. What does that do to you? Well, if he can believe it, I can believe it. Faith is built upon Faith is stirred, my brothers, and it causes us to believe even more. Believe for greater things. And finally, collective worship also creates love. It creates strong relationship with God and with our brothers and sisters in the church. When Jesus died on the cross, a veil was torn in half. That veil was a stop sign. It was a stop sign that said, you cannot come in. No one can come in. On the other side of the veil was the very presence of God. It was called the Holy of Holies. And only once a year, one man, which was a high priest, could go in there. And man, did he have to be holy. He would go in there in representation of of Israel, the people. And he would go in there to to get their sins forgiven. Atonement was made there. People could not access it personally. But when Jesus died on that cross, the veil was torn. And what does this mean for you and me? That stop sign no longer exists. You and I personally, just as we are, can go before the Lord. And have that personal relationship with him. All of us were created with one sole purpose. To be loved by God. To be loved by God. And in response for us to love God with all our hearts. You see, love is at the core of worship. If you love, you will worship. That which your love is put upon, you will worship. So if you love God, you will worship him. It is a natural result of love. There there can't be one without the other. As we worship God, we are loving him. Now check this out. 
When we worship God, we are loving him. When he receives our worship, guess what he does? He loves us right back. He he pours down his love upon us. It is a vertical cycle rising from earth to heaven and falling from heaven to earth of love. And this creates creates such intimate relationship with God, but it also propitiates, I'm sorry, it also propitiates a horizontal cycle. When we, we receive God's love, it cannot stay stored within us. It has to pour out. It has to pour out to our brothers and sisters. When Jesus was asked which commandment was the most important one, In Matthew 22, starting in verse 37, Jesus replied, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. But then he says in verse 39, A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. I have not noticed that word equally. (laughs) The most important uh, commandment is to love God with everything you have, with everything you are. But there's a second one that is of equal importance. Love your neighbor. Love your neighbor. It is of equal importance. This statement that Jesus gave only confirms our purpose of coming to existence. Loving God. God did not create the human being as something to toy around with, something to puppet, or something to have enslaved. He created us as his object of love. He wasn't going to pour his love over a tree. God was not going to pour his love over a pig. Over the ocean. Over the sun. No. He said, I need, I, I'm love. I am love and I need to love. So he created man. But then he said, you know what? I'm going to love him. I'm going to be with him. But at the same time, I see that it's not good for him to be alone. And he created more of us. To love one another, to help one another, to look after one another. When worship happens in community, there is a unity that comes over us. Uh, 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 It's the unity of the Spirit. When we worship, we are fulfilling what Ephesians 4 says. Starting in verse 3, it says, Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit my brothers my sisters worship is a great effort (laughs) it's the best we can do to keep ourselves united in the spirit then it says binding yourselves together with peace for there is one body and one spirit just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And look what it says in verse 6. One God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. When we come and, and, and collectively worship our God, we raise our hands, we lift our voices, God comes over all. He comes over us. But then it says that he will live in us. That he lives in us. And it doesn't stop there. He says that he lives through us. What does this mean? That you will love your brother. That you will love your sister. Love and care. Edmund Burke said, Whatever disunites man from God also disunites man from man. The same could be said of the opposite. Whatever unites man with God also unites man 
with man. And worship is the base, best way that we can be united with God. And worship could bind us in the spirit of peace one with the other. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with this, and I, I'd like the worship team to come up. I believe that as a congregation, we have escalated to another level in worship these past months. Have you, have you noticed it? It says we've, we've stepped to another level in worship. But there is a higher level, church. A level where when we abandon ourselves in worship, powerful and mighty things will start to happen here. They will start to happen even more Every time we gather in unity to worship God. When we come and we lift our hands, when we come and we lift our voices to God, we will, we will cause and we will prepare a place for God to come and do great things. But sometimes we come to church and we come to the worship service. And unfortunately, you know, I, I've seen this and, and I, I don't mean to offend anyone. I don't mean to judge. I don't, you might be going through things or not. But we're up here and Joey's turning all sorts of colors. And then I'm there blaring out. Ah! <laughs> and then we look in the congregation, there's some people. <laughs> We're doing somersaults up here. <laughs> and then there's some. <laughs> and it's like, wow. If they only knew the potential there is in raising their hands. If they only knew the potential there is in raising their voices. If, if, if it's going to take you to raise your voice, if it's going to take your healing to, to, to raise your voice, to lift your hands, if that's what's going to bring a breakthrough in your healing, I think it's worth it. If it's going to bring a, break, a breakthrough in your family, I think it's worth it. If it's going to bring a breakthrough in your faith, I think it's worth it that you come prepared with a worshipful heart. And you lift your hands and you lift your voice. You might not sing that well. And that's okay. We're not going to run you out. <laughs> We're not. You might be ready and you open your mouth and then you hear the one singing next to you. And you're like, oh, I'm not going to sing that good. Maybe your clap is way out of time. It doesn't matter. <laughs> clap. I won't say that. <laughs> I'll have you say that if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a time where we are free that nobody's going to judge you. Nobody gonna, is going to say, man, that guy's crazy. Why is he jumping? Why are they screaming? Why are they? Nobody's going to tell you anything. Believe me. You just got to let yourself go. 
I'm going to ask you to stand, please.